Since the fall of man, a war has raged between good and evil. Over the centuries, this war has distorted the truth. Now the truth is perceived as lies, and lies acknowledged as truth. To this day, the battle continues as we investigate and debate the truth behind the history and mystery of the universe. We are Paratruth Radio. Lately, there has been a frequent debate about the creatures that are spoken of in Genesis 6, called the Nephilim. Some people believe that these Nephilim, who were gods among men, still exist today in the shadows, waiting for a time to emerge and take over the world, enslaving mankind. Others believe that the purebred creatures themselves no longer exist but that the descendants of the Nephilim do, and are currently plotting a way to bring about the New World Order. Prepare yourself as we take a dive head first into the world of conspiracy. Now Paratruth presents the Genesis 6 Conspiracy with special guest Gary Wayne. What's going on, Para fans? Welcome to another episode of Para Truth Radio. My name is Justin, and I'm Eric, and we are here for another week of Para Truth Radio. I am kind of excited about this week. This is something we don't usually do here on Para Truth Radio, uh, and that's conspiracy theories. We're going to be talking to Gary Wayne, author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Uh, but to start things off, how are, have your how has your week been thus far, sir? It's been all right. Been uh, pretty busy, uh, just kind of getting things situated uh, work-wise and, you know, finishing out the last couple of uh, projects that I have <clears throat> for school. So, you know, hang it in there. Yeah. You? Yeah, about the same. <laughs> so it's uh, always mm-hmm. bittersweet to be ready for the show, though. Best part of the week, in my opinion. Um, so the, this book that uh, we're going to be talking to Gary Wayne a little about, if, if you guys haven't heard about it, uh, the the subtitle is How Secret Societies and the Descendants of Giants Plan to Enslave human, Humankind. Uh, so definitely going to be a great show something that like I said Eric and I don't usually touch on so uh, I think we will go to the line with Gary Wayne alright Gary welcome to Paratruth Radio how are you tonight very good I'm just so happy to be here tonight to uh, (laughs) discuss uh, my book and uh, whatever else we're going to talk about so very anxious to uh, get going on it and I'm sure the audience will find that you know, some of the things we're going to talk about may tweak their interest in ways that they hadn't really thought about before. Right. <laughs> so just uh, to get our audience a little acquainted with you, tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Yeah, so I'm kind of a recent sort of venture on into the uh, media on this genre, and uh, I wrote a book um, just over a year ago and had it published, but I started actually doing research on this, and I'm from Canada, I live in Vancouver, Canada, started doing research on prophecy, which is sort of my main um, sort of passion uh, about 35 years or so ago, and I kind of combined prophecy and mythology and history as part of my passion when doing the research about it because you kind of have to know about history if you want to learn about prophecy Mm. uh, so you can understand it for the future. And Mm -hmm. so when I decided that after I sort of mapped out all of these different streams that happen in uh, prophecy, uh, I thought maybe I would start on what I was thinking was going to be uh, my easiest book, my shortest book. And I was going to just cut my trade on writing a book on the giants of Genesis 6 and how does that connect to the end time with the demons and the abyss and some of the uh, 
prophecies about uh, the days would be like Noah's, Jesus said. So, But as it turned out, it's probably going to be the longest book I write because as I started connecting the dots and, and, and doing the research, it just kept opening more and more and more doors that I just kept adding more material and connecting more dots and kind of took on a life of its own. And so when I did publish the book, and it's a large book at, you know, 800 pages, um, I, I took 25% out of it just so that it would be at least at a size where somebody might want to try and read it all. <laughs> <laughs> So just a little bit of humor on that. but um, So that's a little bit about how I came about doing it. And, uh, you know, I worked uh, in business uh, for one company for 37 years and uh, became uh, moved up the ladder to, uh, right next to the CEO. Didn't actually become a CEO, but bid on the job. Um, and then I just recently retired a few months ago, and I'm working hard at promoting my book and uh, looking at writing some more books because I have about 12 or 15 other books that I'd like to write, but I'm pretty darn sure I'm not going to make it as long as the first one, though. Yeah, I would hope. I would hope to keep it a little <laughs> bit shorter than, than the, the size that we got here. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well, now, I, I've noticed throughout a lot of my research, and just you, I see it a lot on uh, social media as well. There's just this overwhelming, um, uh, I, I guess this overwhelming a need for people to want to research the whole Genesis 6 conspiracy and the whole idea of Nephilim still existing and being amongst us in the world and so on and so forth. But for you, why do you, why is it important to you to have this book come out and, uh, you know, tell us about the conspiracy exactly? Yeah. So, I mean, the thing that became very, very clear to me as I was doing some of the research and some of the things I never thought that I would sort of look at part of the research was I wanted to connect a complete narrative and, and A, that had not been done and the second thing I wanted to do was is I wanted to bring some credibility to the genre. So in the book I've got over 100, page of end, 100 pages of end notes and I show everybody where my research came along. And so the reason why I want to connect it even more than it was just more of a passing sort of curiosity and, and cut my trade on the first book on this one was that as I did the research, some things became very, very clear that kind of surprised me. One is is that, you know, the tale of, of the giants and the tale of Genesis is a story that is told around the world on all continents uh, in basically every culture, and almost all of them have things connected into them like the giants and the flood uh, and a, a golden age of prehistory and a rebellion of the gods and only a few people supplying or surviving the, uh, the flood. And also what struck me was is when I started to find this material on the rise of mysticism and the rise of the secret societies, that they were rising at the same time as the descendants of Cain were falling away and developing what became to be known in my book as the Seven Sacred Sciences, which is a name that Freemasonry and the Masonic societies call it, and that I learned that they trace their roots back to that same period of time. And so when you start looking at the rise of giants, the decay of the lineage of Seth into evil, the, the rebellion of the fallen angels, and the rise of the Masonic societies, and this is all sort of not told in this stingy little verse in Genesis 6 that leads right into the narrative flood, now you've got something. And then when you see all of this seems to somehow survive the flood, and they all seem to be part of the world and working today as they influence history in the same manner, and that they are talking about bringing about the end time, then I could not not tell the story, um, even though a lot of times I didn't want to. So doing the research that you did for the book, uh, I mean, there's, there's numerous names in here, and I'm sure there is some way of tracking it, but was there anywhere specifically that you saw where these different uh, families can truly link their bloodlines to uh, the Nephilim or even descendants of, uh, of, of Cain right. even? Right. Okay, so um, you've got a, a few different streams that, that you can look at for that. 
Um, most of the genealogies, though, or pretty much all of the genealogies for the most part, except for what Lawrence Gardner would have wrote, wrote, wrote about and uh, published, uh, they're all genealogies that are kept within the families, right? Okay. But it doesn't matter whether or not you talk about the uh, royal family of England or the Habsburgs or the Stuarts or uh, any of the 13 families that, that I name in the book. They all keep genealogies and they have these genealogies in their records that take them back to, at least from what they say, to the, defend, the descendants of being Nephilim and then back to before the flood and connecting right to the fallen angels. And what's really important to remember is, is it's, not, it's not what I believe and it's not what Christians believe when we talk about this. It's what they believe and then what they're doing with that belief. Right. That's what's important. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, now, I know there's a lot of uh, discussion amongst the uh, Christian community that the Nephilim, as they were back in Genesis 6, still exist today, and that there's some conspiracy in which either they're living underground or perhaps they are, uh, you know, what are considered aliens nowadays and they live up in space. Uh, do you have any view on that or any opinions? Yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of speculation like that, and... Uh you know, somehow that perhaps even that the abyss has already been open, but um, I leave, I kind of leave the underground sort of thing to just sort of the speculation part, and you'll notice I don't have anything like that in my book. Um, but I, what I can talk to is is about um, the descendants of uh, of the giants uh, as they come down through the royal families and the thirteen families, but. I think when you when we start talking about connecting, whether it's aliens um, and all of these other theories, there is, and I write about it in in my book uh, quite extensively, is, is that there are connections between these sort of mythologies or these mythoses that go back right into prehistory. So if you want to find a way to connect um, aliens and Nephilim, well, the first standard one from a Christian approach is, is how people deal with the alien phenomena is, is that they're demons and fallen angels. Angels, which is, mm-hmm. I think, you know, part of the case for sure. And I think a lot of it is is that sort of delusion or that deception. But if you look into um, fairy mythology, for example, and I'm not sure whether or not you're familiar with this, but there are four different classifications of fairies. And the fairy mythology I talk about a lot as an allegory in the book, but also as a bloodline and also as a fairy faith. Mm. Uh, which is part of this whole sort of religious thing. And they connect fallen angels uh, into the fairy mythology. And so in the four kinds of fairies that they believe in, then the fallen angels are the rebellious angels that came from other planets. And in that case, I guess they could be an alien, but that's not really where I'm driving with with it on that. But certainly one connection, and that's the ones who also created earthborn fairies. And these are the ones that also, in fairy mythology, rebelled against uh, the god of the universe. So we have a very similar story here in the first two kinds of of uh, fairies with the fallen angels and Nephilim, so, uh, so fairies and earthborn fairies. And then the next one is demons or daemons, which is the bodiless spirits of the original Nephilim. And the fourth one is where it really gets interesting. You've got three classifications of elementals, and elementals are the little people. And those are the gnomes and the leprechauns and the little people. And the gnomes are the really kind of ugly ones, and they also keep the records and the archives of this ancient history and this ancient knowledge. And within that gnome uh, section of the pair, uh, of the of the little ones is uh, a specific one that's kind of a ugly, small, little, spindly armed ones and, and a big round head. And uh, they're known as the as the gray neighbors in Scotland and just as gray fairies in other uh, fairy mythology. And these are the ones that somehow fly through a portal. They have spaceships. They have significant technology. They kidnap people. Uh, they, if you didn't think it was, uh, if you didn't know it was a fairy abduction, you'd swear it was an alien abduction. Right. abduction. And I put one of those uh, in the book. And I think when we look at the alien phenomena is that we, we classify it as aliens today because that's kind of the mental sort of technical um, environment that we live in today and it's how we think and it's easier to accept. Mm-hmm. And I think beforehand when you have all of these 
types of beings being recanted in fairy mythology on the little ones and the kidnapping and the DNA experiments and all this knowledge that they have and that's what they want to share. That was a narrative understood in terms of their technology level. And I think this has been with us all the way through. So when we look at what possibly happened in prehistory, you have not only the Nephilim being created, but you have this development of these sciences to a level that's likely beyond what we have today. If you consider all the other mythologies around the world, and Atlantean mythology particularly is good at bringing some of this out, Mm -hmm. and that there was this DNA manipulation that was going on as well, and other types of hybrid beings going on. So I think when we look at sort of this this uh, family of aliens that people describe from lizard people to little gray aliens to big furry guys like in uh, Chewbacca and Star Wars and all these different ones. And there seems to be in that alien mythology almost a hierarchy of those animals. I think what we're seeing in fairy mythology and entertainment is a reflection of those beings. And if the little people survived along with the giants on the flood, no matter how they did that, then that could be part of it. But I'm just making that link because they seem to have parallel stories, parallel religions, and parallel histories. Okay. okay. So uh, we, talking about the the fairy uh, lineage a little bit, uh, the one that always comes to my mind uh, is it, King Arthur because he is part of that folklore um, and one thing that I've come across a couple of times is people claiming that King Arthur was actually Jesus Christ coming to Great Britain uh, during his time when he was starting his, his uh, church did you ever come across anything that would link that to, to King Arthur at all? No, nothing that I could really tie. I mean, I read a little bit on that, but that's kind of one of those ones that are a little bit out there. So I, I, I stayed more with um, sort of the true spirit of King Arthur, if I can put it that way, and written from the uh, concept and what the writers were trying to get across, which comes out of the um, you know the secret societies and, and the Templars and the Gnostic religions who are all deeply involved in laying out uh, King Arthur and Camelot and uh, connecting that within their their uh, living environment. So that's that's the spirit which I talk from it from. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, and, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and I, and I think within King Arthur, I mean, it's an interesting story with a bit of Christian gloss on the surface, but underneath you really get into very much an occultic sort of story that's underneath and inclusive of fairies being in there like the ladies of the lake Mm -hmm. uh i mean all the ladies are basically fairies and guinevere is just a sort of fairy phantom name that sort of links back to ireland and of course the tuatha danan are the fairy people of ireland who king arthur is connected back to in the genealogies of king arthur so you've got this Mm -hmm. fairy thing that's going on and of course the ladies of the lake for example they they guard these portals right that's part of the fairy mythology and if you don't Right, and just like uh, in the in a lot of the fairy mythology, they just call them fairy knolls or fairy mounds or shays, right? But those are the uh, the pathways to uh, another world, or Anwin as it's called in King Arthur, or an other world, or Tartarus as it's called in other uh, mythologies. And the other thing you've got going on in there is that you've got this this uh, round table of what they call knights, but these are a round table of kings. And you take Gawain, for example, which is a uh, Norwegian or a Viking king that's oddly in this uh, allegory. And uh, so you've got a whole bunch of different things that are going on in King Arthur that is uh, quite a bit different than, you know, finding this this chalice, right? Right. <laughs> and uh, actually, you know, if you get, get into the detail of what they're talking about in this grail quest that they're trying to find, they're trying to find something that's going to heal the land and bless the land and, and make it fruitful. So this is not uh, a Christian story. It just ha- it's just sort of covered with Christian gloss. And one of the the main imperatives uh, for the writers, uh, and most of the writings of this were done, you know, well after, you know, the year 1000 and and more into about 1200 to about 1500 and heavily sponsored by the Gnostics and the Templars. And, And that's why you see such 
so much Templar imagery in the uh, the, the uh, Holy Grail um, imagery with the knights, because, otherwise, because it doesn't fit, right? Because they didn't get created until mm-hmm. 1099. So, you know, what's it doing there, and where does that inspiration come from? But it's there to put in the genealogies that connect back to um, Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, that's the idea behind what they're doing with the Grail family, and that Grail family are those descendants that link back to Joseph, but more importantly in their belief system, not to Joseph, but um, somebody by the fellow uh, who is a fisher king called Josephes, which in their mythology and, and in their writings is is uh, the third born son of uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And of course, now that just opens up a whole nother sort of avenue of, of, of intrigue. But that's what they're trying to do with, with this, is just keep this record. And also in there, I mean, I just love reading um, Arthur and uh, the Holy Grail because of all of the imagery. And you look at Merlin. I mean, he's not this, this very strange individual that looks like a uh, enchanter or a wizard out of Atlantis. Mm-hmm. Well, and, that's, and that's exactly the type of uh, mythology that uh, is being portrayed here. Or he's like a wise man out of Chaldea. And that's representing the religious aspect or the polytheist aspect of of this uh, story. And at the end of it, they talk about... Um, you know they're going to have to go away because it's now going to be the time of Christianity, and that's talking about their religion and their kingships are going to go underground for um, a certain degree because of the rise of Christianity and the persecution against them that's going to happen. Now, obviously, written sort of you know from a thousand years later almost, but right. that's what they're conveying. Right. Right. Well, now. I, before we, we started talking about King Arthur, uh, when Justin had asked, uh, you know, about King Arthur being Jesus who's come back, you, you said that that was a little bit out there. So yeah. within your research, is there anything in particular that either you wrote about in the book or haven't wrote about that really is just so out there that you just completely, you know, ignore it altogether? Um, well, the, the stuff that was so far out there, I, I didn't spend, you know, a ton of time researching it. It either seemed to have some parallel testimonies and stories and, and something that's fact-based or historical-based or something from ancient mythology or mm-hmm. religions. If it didn't have that, then I didn't really chase it. Okay. All right, folks. I think we're going to take our first break here. You've been listening to Gary Wayne talk about his book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Uh, we will be right back after Eric's Random Fact of the Day. Now, Eric's Random Fact of the Day. Have you ever wondered what the world's most famous color is? Well, according to YouCreative.com, According to various international studies, the world's most popular color is actually blue. Based on the survey conducted by several global marketing firms, they've concluded that people worldwide picked blue, 40%, as their favorite color, followed by purple, by 14%. Though some researchers also suggest that red and green are a close second and third, respectively. White orange, and yellow are some of the least favorite colors. As if that wasn't an interesting color fact in and of itself, did you know that red is the first color a baby sees? Also according to YouCreative.com, recent studies have shown that infants as young as two weeks of age can already distinguish the color red, probably because red has the longest wavelength among colors, making it the easiest color to process by the developing receptors and nerves in the baby's eyes. All right, folks, welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name is Justin. And I'm Eric. And we're talking to Gary Wayne about his book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. For you guys watching on YouTube, it's right there on the screen for you. So, uh, Gary, uh, one thing that uh, has always interested me about the the Genesis 6 Conspiracy is the fact that there is this uh, 
DNA manipulation or it, the Nephilim having descendants with human women. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your research into that aspect of the book? In terms of how uh, the type of DNA and things that are being passed down, with right? The how, how is how is it being passed down, or is it is it more of a bloodline as far as birth, or are they just n- genetically manipulating people to have this this nephilim blood in them? Yeah. Yeah, so I think when, and especially when a lot of people talk about it, there's two aspects to it, and particularly with the technology that we're going on today is are we able to produce new Nephilim through DNA manipulation through our own technology, and they don't necessarily have to be descendants of the Nephilim, or is it the alien alien DNA manipulation? That Those are different aspects that are possibility uh, for the end time. Um, but as I talk most of about in the book, I am actually talking about blood relatives. Okay. And when I talk about blood relatives, let's just sort of do a little bit of background to give a little bit of understanding uh, for the audience as to where I'm coming from. So these Nephilim, when they rose both in the um, antediluvian epoch and after the flood, they rose because of their size and in partnership with, with the religions and the secret societies. Uh, to become the kings of uh, those worlds. Mm-hmm. And so they established the dynasties. And again, when we just use that sort of analogy of King Arthur, that round table is analogous of the ring of uh, Lord, Lord of the Rings uh, and, the, and the rings of kingship of the Anunnaki in the Sumerian mythology. And that's where that... Um, sort of allegory goes back to just as all those knights as i said weren't just knights they were all kings and that's that's one of those hidden symbolisms behind the round table so they established the kingships and the dynasties and they knew that their immortal spirit or was gone after god limited life to 120 years and then after the flood as well um, they're trying to advance their cognitive abilities and to live longer and this becomes part of this blood drinking ritual that's involved in, in the descendants of the Nephilim and which will eventually come out in sort of vampire mythologies and things like that. Okay. But the important thing to remember is is they have to reproduce, right? So mm-hmm. they're going to reproduce generally within their own families to keep the blood pure because they believe that within their blood, A, it's, it's, it comes from the God. So they have this right to rule with that bloodline. And that's a significant piece that they have to keep in place. And so when they're trying to um, keep the blood from gaining disease, now they have to enter in other marriages, right? Some outside blood. So they're going to try and remarry then within the kingships of the ancient world to get some of that sort of fresh blood into the DNA pool, but still keep their bloodlines pure. And that's one of the reasons why they have to track these genealogies. And then the next thing that they do is is when they're really starting to run out of uh, fresh blood, um, they have to go into some diluted bloodlines. Still ennobled and still heavily influenced, but enough blood that's going to allow them to not become sort of deformed freaks, right? (laughs) So, and that's why you see whether or not it was, you know, we'll talk about the post diluvian epoch because there's some history that people can maybe get their arms around. So you have um, the Akkadian and the Chaldean and the Mesopotamian dynasties that uh, come from Nimrod. That's one pillar after Babel. And then you have the Egyptian uh, dynasty that goes with uh, Hermes and Mizram and um those families over to Egypt, and those are the two main ones of the Middle East of that time. But you also have the Hittites as an example, and you also have the Mitanni dynasty, and then you have the Malachite dynasty. So you got about a half and a dozen of these very, very powerful dynasties that are all intermarrying and uh, trying to keep the bloodlines as pure as they can, at least back to some form of Nephilim pure stock. And that continues all throughout the ages, and people wonder why why the royals always intermarry whether or not it's you know it's right it's because they're they track these genealogies and they're trying to keep it pure and a lot of people speculate that you know the bloodline um sort of smoking gun on this is the rh negative bloodline but 
and that's interesting and it's possible, but we don't have that as an absolute sort of connection. But it's certainly a possibility that if there was something injected into the human bloodline, there should be something that stands out that sort of can point back to that. This goes back to um, the uh, uh, the fallen angels as being interjected with, with, with their bloodlines. Um, but it also starts to mesh with this idea of the bloodlines. Are you familiar with something called Vril, V-R-I-L? I'm, I'm not. I <laughs> okay. kind of heard of it a little bit. So it was a, a major, major uh, ideology of the Nazis. Um, and again, such a wonderful place to have to do research oh, the, from. the real society, so yeah. Mm-hmm. Y- yes, it's one of their societies. And of course, they, they take their belief system, because they're very occultic, back to... Uh, Thule and Atlantis, right, from the Aryans, right? And they're talking about a civilization uh, deriving from the giants and that they are are trying to be part of or at least trying to maybe genetically work backwards to get back to that sort of genetic base of of a superior being or the new man. Hmm. But their concept of the Vril is is a potency, you know, within the blood, possibly Rh negative, but we don't know that. And that something from that blood can, could sponsor a future race of super beings. And it's a belief and a doctrine that was based in uh, not only bloodlines and keeping those bloodlines, but race purity. So you start to see sort of the same sort of philosophy that is coming out of this, especially when you understand that, you know, they mix that with Volkish ideology. Um, which is based on hero worship or the hero collective. And, of course, hero worship goes back to Taoism and to Greek mythology. And what that is is the worship of a demon, which is the bodiless spirit of a giant that isn't allowed to go to sleep and is not allowed into heaven. So all of this continuously always works back to a consistency in the story. And so when we look at things in the blood, uh, that is one place to look at. And, And... they also seem to um, require OH negative uh, blood uh, to help populate that's being put into their bloodlines, and that's because OH kind of mixes with OH negative mixes with pretty much all bloodlines. Okay. Um, but RH negative is very very difficult to produce um, offspring from, so they they need help and they need continual in blood to continue to populate. Hmm. But they don't talk about this RH. A negative bloodline. They just talk about what's something in the blood. But what they do talk about in their religions is what they call the gene of Isis. Okay. And that's the root word for Genesis. And so, again, you can see the sort of split of belief systems coming right out of Genesis from the polytheist belief system and the monotheist belief system. Mm-hmm. And so they believe mm-hmm. this gene goes back to Isis, right? And Isis is one of those um, mother goddesses, uh, this one coming out of the Egyptian mythology that married with a god to produce giants in Egypt. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be Gaia and Zeus in um, in um uh, Greek, for example, right. um, and the Sumerians have the same. All the other mythologies have a god marrying a mother earth human being uh, to produce these giants. And in the Atlantean philosophy, or, or philosophy, the mythology, it was Poseidon and climbing and producing ten giant twins that ruled the ten um, nation empire of Atlantis that was trying to march in and set up a complete world government back there. So they believe in this gene of Isis that the descendants have this gene. And these are the people that they want to populate the earth with uh, in the end time. And that's why when you talk about the Rosicrucians and uh, trying to limit the population back from, let's say, an example from the Georgia uh, stones, uh, I think they use the number of 500 million in, in that example. They are only concerned, they don't really only want enough humans around to serve them and, and do their ritual sacrifices. So what they're, what they're talking about is, is getting to a place of world government with one religion that they would call a new Atlantis and the symbology that comes out of uh, Francis Bacon. All of this is not sort of, uh, um, separate stories and, and they're just, coming from different uh, sources, but they're all telling the same story. And they want this world government to to bring this, this gene of ISIS or what they would also term as uh, a term called the spark of the divine. And they want to bring this back so that they can 
evolve or vibrate in a harmonic convergence in, in parts of their language and, and, and religion into a higher level of being or into a god. And so when you hear the secret societies and the code in their speeches, you might want to listen for some of this. And that comes out, and I think George Bush Sr. was very, very... Um, sort of poetic in one of his speeches on it and they call that the thousand points of light and they need that to come together so they need that universal religion and they need that that uh, world government that they're trying to bring about so that they can fulfill their new age or their new Atlantis hmm. mm-hmm. now we're talking about a group of people here you know who, who eventually you know would at some point take over the world and run humanity in, in a sense um now there is a theory, maybe this goes along the same lines, of the Antichrist himself being part Nephilim or having Nephilim blood. Now is this something that this group would create themselves, or would this be a separate entity altogether? Well, you're going to see a little bit probably of both because um, you're going to have a, uh, a human type of being that's going to be the Antichrist. But we also hear from Revelation that, um, that you know the Antichrist is the person who once was, now is not, but comes up out of the abyss. So I think there's a, there's a possession as well as, okay. as a human that happens in the end time. So I don't want to just get stuck on one, but from what they believe in terms of their bloodlines, they are believing that they are going to present the false messiah, their messiah, to the world. And these, this messiah will have the pedigree, and I use that word specifically as, uh, you know, as when you're um, following the lines of horses or dogs, right? But this is a pedigree that they're going to use as part of um, their credibility factor for the Antichrist in the end time. So they always have three Antichrists uh, on the go all of the time. Three people that are initiated and are at a super level and are protected and kept hidden because they would take the shot at presenting this at any point in time. They'll accept the ordained time, but they're ready to go all of the time. So their plan is, is to present one of their own to the world to be the Antichrist when the time comes. Okay. Now, do these families believe that, like through their 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 belief systems, do they believe mm-hmm. if they uh, get this antichrist into power that they'll be given uh, reparation, if you will? Yeah. So there's, I mean, this is part of the delusion on the other side as well. So what their what what their belief system says is is that Lucifer and the God of the Christians are equal. That God is a God, but so is Lucifer. And that it's that sort of dualism belief system that they have good versus evil that's Mm -hmm. always in balance, right? And and is never ending, and you see that in all sorts of science fiction, whether it's Star Mm -hmm. Wars or whatever, Right. right? Right. Right, so it's that concept. And so what they believe is, is that um, Lucifer is is the great um, is the great light, and he's the one who fights for the good of humankind. And that the God of the Bible is, is the evil God who enslaves humankind in in the physical world and keeps knowledge from them and and keeps them suppressed just so that they'll worship them. And what Lucifer has done is given us this knowledge. This is their belief, not my my belief. Mm. Uh, has given them this knowledge. And that through knowledge or gnosis or Gnosticism, which is where all that connects from, and the Garden of Eden where that story starts and that belief starts, mm. is, is that knowledge helps them in their quest to become like God. It's one of the key aspects and the okay. discipline of that knowledge. And that's where you hear reason over faith. And that's where that sort of doctrine comes from. So they're trying to discipline the knowledge to raise their technology and their ability to be like God. And so... What is going on here is is that they are taught that they can fight for their freedom, and they need to take God and the Christians on in the end time and fight for their freedom so that they can be part of this larger collective of beings in the universe that um, are also fighting for their freedom. And again, you see that as a common sort of narrative that you see in um, 
in uh, science fiction um, movies, but you could take that back into history where you've got all these other different rebels fighting for their freedom from the evil church or the evil king, which is always an allegory for the church, just like in Robin Hood, for example. Um, king John is, is an allegory for the, the Catholic Church for them, and the, the merry men are these people fighting for freedom, right? And Maid Marian is, is the uh, uh, estranged wife of Jesus, uh, Mary, and of course Robin Hood is, is the uh, succession to uh, the kingship, who, um, and both of them are sort of out of power, and they're trying to get the power back, right? They're trying to fight for their freedom. They, they do these mm-hmm. allegories in everything that they do, because they like to hide um, in plain sight with everything they're doing, because they know most people don't understand the language of, of, of what they're doing. Right. But the, at the end of the day, is they believe they can win, but they are going to have to fight for this freedom, and that's why the rebellion in the end time comes and all of the horrific things in the end time because they want to bring this day of destiny on so that they can win their freedom and live in another universe. And again, that is in perfect sort of harmony to what the fairy belief is, is is that uh, Lucifer um, rebelled knowing that he probably doesn't win, but that he could have a universe like God but separate. And again, that's what they're Mm -hmm. hoping to get out of it. Okay. That's their belief system. Now, with all of the talk about conspiracy and, of course, all of the books that are coming out, why do you think the whole idea of the Genesis 6 conspiracy is so popular and so important to, to, to for people to learn and understand? Uh, I remember just a few years ago, it wasn't, you know, the, the whole conspiracy theory thing wasn't huge, huge, especially in regards to biblical, the biblical sense. But lately, I find a lot more people talking about this Genesis 6 conspiracy and the rise of the Nephilim and so on and so forth. Why do you think that society today or those in society today are so hung up on it? Well, again, I think we're instructed to learn about it, and particularly as we get closer to the end time, that to understand what's going to happen, because, you know, so many things are sealed up, is what Daniel says, but, you know, Jesus clearly said that the end times will be like the days of Noah. So if you are, and and certainly it's my belief and inclination that we're continually approaching closer and closer to the end times, that... If that's the case, then we need to understand everything that went on in prehistory, both, you know, when we talk about the days of Noah, not only before the flood, but what happened immediately after the flood, which, again, is filled Mm -hmm. with Nephilim, right? And that we learn that in Revelation that these beasts come up out of the abyss again, the angels that were locked away, and perhaps some of the more vicious demons were locked away in the abyss to affect the end times. We also know that demons... Um, they participate in rounding the end time kings up for war. And we also know that in Revelation, uh, in Revelation 12, for example, where a third of the angels are, are sent down from heaven, and that includes Lucifer. And you've got all of these different things going on and the re- reference to the Antichrist coming up out of the abyss. So to, to resolve what might be going on here as we get closer, I think people are saying, hey, we've not been taught in church about what happened in Genesis 6 or what happened after the flood. They never tend to want to talk about that. And yet we're being told by our Messiah, our Redeemer, that we need to know about that to understand the end time. And I think that's kind of what is driving more people to say, what really went on and how, how does that relate to what, with what will happen in the end time? All right. Well, folks, we're going to take our second and last break of the evening. You're listening to Paratruth Radio, and we will be right back after Justin's Paranormal Headlines. And now, Paratruth Radio's Paranormal Headlines. How's it going, Parafans? Justin here with your Paranormal Headlines. And these headlines are from unexplainedmysteries.com. Can the moon really affect human behavior? A new study has attempted to answer once and for all how lunar phases affects our moods and actions. 
The phases of the moon have long held spiritual and metaphysical significance for mankind, and even today remain associated with everything from bouts of erratic behavior to sleep deprivation. Now, though, in a renewed bid to find out if the moon really can make a difference to how we behave, a team of researchers from the Eastern Ontario Research Institute have analyzed the sleeping patterns of 5,812 children during several different phases of the moon. Conducted over 28 months, the study found that there was a mere five-minute difference between the average amount of sleep recorded during a full moon and that recorded during a new moon. Our study provides compelling evidence that the moon does not seem to influence people's behavior, said Dr. Jean-Philippe Chapot. The only significant finding was the 1% sleep alteration in full moon, and this is largely explained by our large sample size that maximizes statistical power. Overall, I think we should not be worried about the full moon. Our behaviors are largely influenced by many other factors like genes, education, income, and psychosocial aspects rather than by gravitational forces. 15-year-old discovers a forgotten Mayan city. Teenager William Gattery has become a social media sensation after locating a city in the Yucatan jungle. Having been fascinated by the Mayan civilization ever since hearing about the 2012 apocalypse prediction, the 15-year-old who is from St. Jean de Matha in Quebec came up with a theory suggesting that the location of Mayan cities might correspond to the positions of the stars. To put this to the test, he tried overlaying Mayan star maps with satellite images from Google Earth and was able to confirm that there was indeed a correlation between the two as he had predicted. Using his new method, William was able to infer the existence of another, previously undiscovered city at a location which matched up to the position of one of these stars. To confirm his finding, he collaborated with both the Canadian Space Agency and Dr. Armand LaRoque from the University of New Brunswick, who applied digital image processing to satellite photographs of the region to see if there was anything there. It turned out that the 15-year-old had been spot on all along and had actually discovered a major new Mayan city containing 30 buildings and a pyramid measuring 86 meters in height. William has opted to name the new city Kakchi, which means mouth of fire. And this has been Justin with your Paranormal Headlines. This was a segment of Parachute Radio's Paranormal Headlines. Welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name is Eric. And I'm Justin. And we are talking with Gary Wayne, the author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Now, Gary, we are coming up to our last few minutes here of the show. So the one thing that we'd like to do is give you a second chance here tonight to let everyone know where they can find you, where they can find your book. And of course, feel free to plug any other books you have coming out or pretty much anything you'd like. <laughs> Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, you can get my book, uh, first of all, through my website if you want uh, a signed copy or a um, personalized copy in any way, and that's www.genesis6conspiracy.com, and that's Genesis 6 with the number 6 as opposed to the spelling of 6. And uh, on there, uh, you can also see... Uh, a generous excerpt of every chapter of all 98 chapters to get a good flavor of what it's all about. And I also tend to post a lot of my interviews on there. So if you want to see other interviews to hear about maybe other aspects of the book, you can go there. There's also connections where you can go to amazon.com or amazon.ca and it's also carried by amazon.uk and amazon.com AU and Amazon around the world. 
Barnes & Noble also carries it. Uh, it's also carried by most online bookstores around the world. And if you want to buy it from your local um, bookstore or your local Christian bookstore in particular, it's distributed through Send the Light Distribution and Ingram. So if they don't have it on the shelf, they can get it that way. So, uh, And if people are looking to follow me uh, or to ask me questions, and I do get back to pretty much everybody on, um, on the questions that they get, unless I've missed it somehow, uh, you can get a hold of me either through my website and send me a note there, or you can get a hold of me through Facebook. Uh, I have a Gary Wayne page, and I have two Genesis 6 conspiracy pages. And you can also follow me on Twitter at GaryWayne63. Uh, no current other books out, but I am looking at possibly doing another one down the road. I'm in the middle of it, but nowhere close enough to really be out there promoting it. No, hey, I feel your pain not being a writer and trying to get myself off there as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, Gary, thank you so much for being on. And uh, the the book is so vast that we could probably do like five episodes with you mm-hmm. and, and still have questions on top of that. So yeah, we just barely skimmed the surface, right. but hopefully people have got a flavor as to how far it uh, it. Uh, expands or, right. or what it covers and uh, maybe it tweaks some curiosity to dig a little deeper on some of these subjects and that's really what I'm trying to do on the book is is to have people say okay, here, here's for the first time is, is one complete narrative and if it encourages you to look a little bit deeper and, and take this story a little bit further um, then that's, that's really, I have my mission accomplished. Mm-hmm. Right. All right, well, I will uh, let you go for the evening, but as soon as you have any new books coming out, let me know. We'll get you back on for those. But uh, until then, have a good night. Terrific, and thank you for having me. All right. Hey, bye. All right, folks, that was Gary Wayne, author of the Genesis 6 Conspiracy. If you guys are watching YouTube, one more time there for you. Uh, definitely really interesting Uh Eric and I try to steer away from the conspiracy theories just because we have our our second thoughts, if you will, about s- several of them. Uh, but uh, Gary does break it down in a way that uh, you can kind of see the connections a little bit and under- start understanding where Genesis 6, 6 connects to other areas of, of time. Um so definitely check it out, uh, Genesis Six Conspiracy dot com. I'll have the the website in your in the uh, show notes for you as well. Uh, next week uh, we've got somebody who we've been wanting for quite some time now, uh, Brad Steger, about his newest book as well. Uh, so definitely stay tuned for that. If you guys missed. Jerry's show last week. Definitely go check that out, out uh, for Tiger Girl for God Radio. And uh, anything new on your end you need to share? No, sir. <laughs> I know the the movie is just about at its end for you. So yeah, so it's it's pretty much on to uh, new, new things. We got I've got new films that are currently in the works uh, with a couple of other uh, friends and coworkers. So we're gonna be. Uh, Starting pre-production on a couple other films this this summer, um, so there'll be plenty more stuff coming forth. The good thing, though, is for some of the films that one in particular we're going to be getting into. I guess there is news. Okay, apparently there's news. <laughs> um, so there is one film that I shot a few months back we, we, when we had Lewis Guthrie on, one of my buddies. Right. Uh, we had talked about a film very briefly called Knock Knock that we are going to start shooting. Uh, it's one that he wrote and directed. I did the. Uh, uh, all the cinematography on it and we're actually going to be getting into the edit rooms uh soon within like probably this weekend actually we're supposed to do it this past weekend just didn't work out so we're going to probably do it this weekend coming up uh, if there's time uh and we're going to start doing work in post-production on that and the good thing about that is it most likely won't be going at any film festivals just kind of something fun that we wanted oh. to do and you know just get things along so once that's completed and we get all the sound done and so on and so forth that's something i'll probably probably be uploading straight to uh my vimeo channel i'm sure he'll be uploading it to his as well so we'll be bringing it straight to all of you to kind of just check it out rate it you know tell us what you think uh just something fun that we wanted you know it took us a weekend to shoot which 
three day, not even two days it took us two days to shoot it which is completely different from the ten days that it took to right. shoot my film um, so you know it, you gotta imagine it's not gonna be nearly uh, as I don't think as spectacular but it's gonna be pretty good pretty cool I think it's interesting we, we kind of uh, we're being a little artsy with it playing with different angles and stuff like that so you know within the next probably a couple weeks actually we'll have that coming out to you guys but I'll keep you updated on that later so and of course it will be on paratruthradio.com once that does get uh, finalized for you guys uh, so a lot of great stuff going on guys uh, as always you can find us on YouTube iTunes iHeartRadio paratruthradio.com Spreaker uh, ptrnetwork.com and any other podcasting app or software you like to use and uh Still nothing yet for, for my end. I'm, I'm working hard at maybe doing self-publishing here within the next month if I don't hear anything. So stay tuned for that as well. I could probably at least get the synopsis up for you guys on paratruthradio.com. But I was kind of hoping to get some artwork first. Um, so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. until next week, folks, when we have on Brad Steaker, where you will find us the same time, <laughs> same channel. My name is Justin. And I'm Eric. Peace. If you enjoyed this episode of Parachute Radio and you would like to listen to it again or are interested in listening to any of our past episodes, then you can listen to them on HD at our website, paratruthradio.com. And you can also find us at Stitcher, Blueberry, TuneIn, iTunes, Spreaker, and YouTube. And of course, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for brand new updates of our show every day.